Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I want to go ahead and get this party started. Uh, whoop, whoop. Thank you for being here on a Thursday evening at the Acadiana Center for the Arts. Uh, my name is Samuel Oliver. I'm the executive director of the ACA. Uh, this panel discussion, entitled The Elephants in the Room, uh, there's a longer version of that. I don't even have it in front of me, so I'm going to leave it at The Elephants in the Room. Uh, is a companion to the exhibition Brandon Ballinger, The Age of Loneliness, which is on view in our main gallery. Uh, that exhibition opened uh, this October 2021 and will close in January of 2022. Uh, we hope you spread the word, encourage uh, friends, family to visit and uh, you know, explore their way through the challenging topics that are presented in this exhibition and have their own conversations like the one that I think we're going to have this evening uh, about a lot of the work that you know, couldn't be more present uh, but couldn't be less discussed in certain spaces. So that's why we're talking about the elephant in the room. Uh, I want to thank the host committee of businesses and individuals who helped make this exhibition possible through their support, especially Lisa and Chuck Boudreaux, the Cuvillon Group, David and John Ella Hayes and IDI Workspaces. This exhibition is also funded in part by a grant from South Arts in partnership with the National Endowment for the Arts and the Louisiana Division of the Arts. And thank you for the Division of the Arts for being here this evening. Thank you, Maida Owens. Uh, this exhibition is also supported in part by a Lafayette Visitor Enterprise Grant from the Lafayette Convention and Visitors Commission. And a big thanks to our year-round visual arts sponsors at the ACA the Louisiana Office of Cultural Development, Doug Ashey Building Materials, and the Haney Family Foundation. Uh, the artist also wishes to thank ArtSpark, Creative Capital, the Deep South Solidarity Fund, and the John Smith, or John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. Uh, I will introduce our moderator, uh, who will then introduce the panelists and get this show on the road. Uh, our moderator this evening is Mr. Christian Mader, sitting on his stool. Thank you. Uh, Christian is the founder and executive editor of The Current, an award-winning investigative and cultural journalist. Christian's work has, been, has appeared in The New York Times, Vice, Offbeat, Gambit, USA Today Network, and The Advocate. He is a Lafayette native, a recovering musician, <laughs> and serves on the program committee for Leadership Lafayette. Uh, he is also a member of The Current's board of directors. Mr. Thank you, Christian. Sir. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for that pleasant pleasant applause. I don't get lots of those since I started recovering from my career in music. Um, so, and I need to update my bio, which it's fine. And, um, and, and to comment, just I mean, who to address that? another elephant in the room, uh, the microphones are, because this is a small space where I think we can hear one another, I'll just ask the panelists to actually kind of project to the back of the room. Uh, the microphones are for recording purposes, uh, and I'd also uh, neglected to thank Acadiana Open Channel, who are recording this this evening, uh, so that it'll, the conversation will go beyond this room. Thank you, AOC. That, that is why I'll be awkwardly looking into this microphone, everyone, <laughs> but like not projecting any voice. I'll do the best I can. So thank you guys so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure um, to be here. Uh, I, uh, you know, as a journalist, talking about things people don't want to talk about is, is what I spend most of my days doing, right? I, I, I like to say that what I do for, when I tell my three-year-old, what do I do for a living? Well, I annoy people for a living, so here we are. <laughs> um, so uh, we do have a great panel uh, of folks um, with us today to, to talk about um, what I think arguably is, is the most significant issue facing Louisiana, and that's in large parts because uh, of all the different um, buckets that you can actually break it down into. When you're, when you're talking about um, a climate crisis, right, it actually gets segmented into a lot of different categories of life. So it's significant for a lot of reasons, in other words. And so we have a sort of, I'd say, a, a multidisciplinary group here to sort of cover that, because that's the way I think, as a society, we have to confront it. Um, so first, uh, I'd like to introduce Brandon Ballinger. He's a multimedia artist and, and responsible for the exhibit uh, here today. Um, he's had fellowships from the Smithsonian and Guggenheim, and he's currently a research associate at the LSU Museum of Natural Science where he's studying the impact of the Deepwater Horizon spill on fish species in the Gulf. Um, if you guys haven't been, uh, his, his, his exhibit, Age of Loneliness, is just stunning and staggering and sort of terrifying. <laughs> and not just because of the imagery of it, right? It, it really does a great job of confronting us with a reality that's very much around us. So Brandon, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. 
we also have uh, Ranina Hart, who's the division director of the Louisiana State Museum. Uh, she lives in Baton Rouge. She's an artist and curator, and she's an advocate for inclusive spaces in that work. Um, she was appointed by Governor Edwards uh, to the Louisiana State Arts Council in 2017. In her work, she actually manages four museums, uh, all the museums that are not in New Orleans, is it? And, it, and they primarily uh, collect history collections, things like that. So, Rodina Hart, thanks for being here. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and then Dr. Ben Dubansky. Uh, he's a research scientist at the University of North Texas uh, with a PhD from LSU. So that's your connection to Louisiana. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I think yeah, I'm doing that. I mean, I just kind of know that that's kind of far from the Gulf, but I mean, I, I get what it is. You're in Denton, right? No, I live in Louisiana now. You do? Okay. Yeah, I sent a revised. Um, I apologize. For that. Okay. How quickly did you move? That was from eight years ago. Actually. That was from eight years ago. <laughs> yes, it was. Okay, I'm copy paste. So where are you now? So let's just, I could just do this as an interview, correct? That's it. <laughs> <laughs> That's with me. Now I live in Louisiana. I've been, we've, I moved back here in June. Okay. Yeah, to Welcome back. resume my work. Great. <laughs> great to have you. Is, is it still accurate that you're still working on the impacts of uh, the oil spill? Et cetera, the species of the Gulf of Mexico. Too, I right? do environmental assessments for legal and scientific purposes. All right, well, very good. So, when in doubt, just ask questions. That's what I always <laughs> say. Perfect. Um, so, um, where to start this conversation, right? Um, I actually felt we, we did a story actually about the exhibition, your exhibition, Brandon, and, and something that um, our reporter, Ty Benowitz, uh, wrote about in, 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 in your conversation, right? You said, you've been trying to get this installation. Right, in Louisiana for 10 years. Uh, it's great, this is your quote, by the way, I don't know if you <laughs> It's great that ACA is willing to take that risk because extinction isn't political, right? So I guess my first question to the panel is, like, we're in here having a discussion. You've got sponsors who are sponsoring this event. This is a taboo conversation in Louisiana because it forces us to confront some things that are pretty ugly about our history. So, but here we are talking about it, Brandon. What's changed? Over the past ten years, sure. Well, I think I think overall, since Deepwater Horizon, there is more of an openness to have these kind of discussions about the complexities of these issues, and that hasn't completely changed <laughs> because people still don't want to realize or are struggling with uh, the fact that we have to adapt and change very quickly um, our behaviors and the way that we're utilizing natural resources, and in a time when it's increasingly like the water is getting warmer and the frog is cooking and the frog is us along with a lot of other species. So we're trying to adapt to that as quickly as we can. I'm hoping that uh, exhibitions like this help to raise that level of, of discourse uh, in a public platform. Sure. So, so Ben, I'd like to get your perspective as a guy that sort of came back to Louisiana, although Texas is not spiritually or geographically very far away. No. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do think it's fair to say that there, there is more conversation about the topic of climate change, right, in general, but that seems to be a shift. I mean, what in your perception has shifted, if anything? Well, these are all stressors, right? So whether it's the effects of climate change or uh, toxicants in the environment that we're talking about here, it's all stressors on the environment and from my perspective, so I, I look at how the animals respond to these stressors in the environment, and then we come up with an, a way to um, quantify that for the animals, and then hope that people can see and draw the link if we use the correct models. So, Rodina, um, your, your work, I would suppose, takes you around the state a good bit. Yes, right? it does. And, and, you know, it's interesting to think that you know, institutions, right? I made note um, of some of the agencies that are behind this exhibition, mm -hmm. right? Are, you know, suddenly funding work that forces Louisiana to confront bits about its past, right? I mean, is there something changing within arts funding, within government institutions that permits us to sort of have this conversation in a government-funded way? Well, absolutely. Um, uh, the reality of our situation is being confronted um, not necessarily in a way that instantly affects change, but it is being talked about in a way that is, has taken a lot of the political sting out of the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, when we're discussing the duality of this exhibition is supported by a, uh, a institution that uh, is reliant on fossil fuels, but also 
there is an environment that is being directly affected by the pulling of the fossil fuels out of the, the ground, they understand that this is discongruent. They understand that this is a, a broader conversation that is more important than just uh, income. And so they are supporting this kind of discourse, but also in the fullness of it, understanding that this is what supports families. This is what historically has uh, uh, framed up the upward mobility of an entire group of people. Um, this is an institution that has supported um, civil rights and, uh, and different entities throughout its existence. So it's not a villain, but it's also not absolved of its, um, its damage that it's causing. So a lot of people are kind of moving towards an honest conversation, whether it, and it has to kind of start there with the conversation and the honesty and the openness and the real impact, and then it can move more to change. And a lot of these institutions understand that the writing is on the wall, and so they have to pivot to figure out how can we remain relevant and sustainable. So there are important conversations that are happening right now. Now, is it fast enough? I don't know. I hope so. Yeah. For the sake of us and our children and our forebears and all the people. But yeah. Sam, let me bring you into this and put you on the spot. I mean, sure, no problem. <laughs> Is this an easy sell for you? I mean, this just feels like I've covered arts in Lafayette for a while. I, I don't recall ACA as an institution necessarily putting itself into a space like that. I mean, it's unfortunate that we even think about it in those terms, right? That this is a political issue, but <laughs> facts are facts. It's a political issue. So I don't know. How did that work for you? Well, I mean, my perspective is that it's our job to do this uh, as, as an institution that is a uh, an arts council and also a museum uh, that's really focused on a local audience and a regional audience, it's our job to bring up issues that are relevant to that population. Uh, what could be more relevant than this exhibition? Uh, you know, I think the role of art and the role of really, you know, bringing people together to look at something and engage with something, especially in contemporary art, uh, is to create a bit of a safe space where instead of having to have a challenging conversation with your father or your uncle or son or whatever the you know relationship might be or your coworker, uh, you're able to engage with this third thing and instead of talking about an issue that's been in front of you and that you've been avoiding you're able to talk about that thing uh, the thing that's on the wall in front of you or that might be stacked in a pyramid of 500 jars in front of you if you're Brandon <laughs> uh, and it lets you, you know, that's, that's to me the most powerful role of art in so society today is to give people a, a way to communicate with one another because it's really not about the object. Brandon's a, a wonderful artist and a skilled painter and, you know, brilliant, but it's really not about his work. It's about what's behind the work and what, what happens in the space around his work, which is why it's worth putting on a stage and worth any kinds of risks that we might take. Uh, the reality here, too, is that, you know, uh, people who don't want to engage with things like Brandon's exhibition will choose not to, and that's unfortunate, but it's also a reality. So they'll be happy to walk, uh, you know, away from something like this and come away unchanged by it. So as you mentioned earlier, um, Sam, your stand-in for Louis Michaud, um, Lost by Ramblers, and I'm much worse at the fiddle than he is. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I won't call uh, you on it. <laughs> so, so, so Louis sent his regrets, and he also wrote a letter. Um, you know, and I think it's actually a pretty good way of framing up. I think kind of the next conversation, maybe the conversation that we're actually here to have, which is sort of discussing elephants in the room, things that we're unwilling to talk about, and why I think, or why Louis would think that we're actually primed to be having this discussion, right? Which is very, very recent history. So I'm going to read a little bit from it and then kind of think, go around the room maybe and talk a little bit uh, and ask you guys kind of to, to, to maybe respond to it or talk a little bit about what you perceive to be 
let's call them the sub-elephants in the room. They're elephants, right? There's the big elephant that I think we're all talking about, and then I think there are some... Which, which elephant is that? I assume it's climate change, but I don't know. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean there are sub-elephants. There are well, elephants beneath the elephants, Sam. Um, so, so I'm going to read a little bit of, of Louis's letter, so, so bear with me. Um, first, he says, Brandon, thank you for having me on this panel. I'm sorry I couldn't be there to have this discussion in person, so he apologizes. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I'm a musician, not a scientist, though I am the son of a scientist who is also a musician, but it does not take being a scientist to see the elephant in the room. The path that led me to be on this panel began on September 1st, when I decided to use my platform as a musician to try and help a few people affected by Hurricane Ida who needed their roofs tarped and needed basic supplies like food, water, and gas when there was none in the days and weeks after the storm. What started as a trip to bring down essential supplies and short-term relief turned into a mission to provide long-term preparation in the form of solar panels and battery backup, knowing this world would, this would not be the last time these people would lose power for an extended period of time and the troubles that follow in a world dependent on gas and electricity. Um, here in Louisiana, as in many parts of the world, preparing for disaster is something that no one wants to think about because, it's inconveniences, because it inconveniences us on the daily, and this is true on a much larger scale than family households. How do we plan for disaster in the form of oil spills when we can't prioritize properly cleaning up the, defun the defunct oil rigs and miles of pipeline? How do we plan for shortages, water shortages when we allow fracking to pollute the aquifers that make our settlements possible? And how do we plan to slow down coastal erosion and habitat loss in the fastest disappearing landmass on Earth, Louisiana. Okay, so that is a, a lot of elephants in one room. I mean, Brandon, he addressed this letter to you, so I'm going to start with you. Uh, right. Sure. I mean, and, and I would add to what Louis is saying is, you know, he's talking about um, cultural loss and, and, and loss of landscape and environment, but to add on to that, we've got also species loss, right? So it's not just the marsh grasses, it's all the little ants that live in the marsh grasses that are then impacted by the fact those marsh grasses aren't there anymore, or they're covered with oil at different moments in their history because of the, the oil spills that never stop happening in Louisiana. Um, <clears throat> as well as what's going on underneath, what we're not even thinking about, the fish that are migrating from the Gulf of Mexico all along the Atlantic seaboard, all the way over, up into Greenland, touching Europe, going to Africa, and then heading home. You know, so all of those species are like impacted by the, the changes that we're seeing in climate, the continued extraction of petrochemicals from the Gulf of Mexico. When, thi when things go wrong, which they do because we're human beings and things go wrong all the time because we're human beings, but I think one of the things that um, is really relevant to talk about is as humans have to adapt to this changing climate, realizing other species are adapting to it too, what we can learn from them, but also thinking about which behaviors we want to continue doing knowing what these impacts have. Where do we see ourselves in five years or 10 years or 50 years? Put us out of the scenario. Where do we want our grandchildren to be? You know, what, does, what do we want that world to look like? Do we want them to see sawfish? I hope so. <laughs> you know, I want my grandkids to see sawfish. Um, so I guess that would be my first response. Sure. Yeah, ben, I mean, I, I'm curious to kind of, given what I, I take to be your research, right? I mean, you, you're probably looking very closely at the very question that Brandon raised, right? The, the, the idea of like how these species are actually adapting to these stressors as they're being put in the environment. And, and I did see some of your work, you know, even looked at, you know, when they're encountering, you know, what I understand to be sort of sublethal levels of oil. Like, you know, in other words, we're looking at this thing, like, this thing didn't kill a fish, right? We may not even see an apparent level of distress, and yet it is under distress. So I'm curious if you could just sort of respond to that. Like, what, are, what aren't we seeing that's happening out there? Well, part of it is the, the type of assessment tools that, that we've been using over time and how those are maturing, too, with technology that's enabling us to be able to, to, to do a physical on a teeny tiny fish or, you know, to, to really be able to assess these animals like we assess humans, too. Behavior, uh, molecular, and then physiological, you know, like the, the whole organism level. So, uh, you, know, you know, in my world... We're looking to be able to, to quantify the change with, by looking at these animals, by testing these animals. And you, know, you asked about the change in the past 10 years. One of the changes is you know, the increase in available technologies and tools that allows us to be able to assess these environments. Um, so I think as that starts to change, 
um, the it will be less un, less deniable, less and less deniable um, over time um, that there is change that's occurring, and that um, helps with the confrontation of these uh, you know these big questions, these big problems that we have. It's you know climate change is a global problem, but uh, changing the environment is a Louisiana problem. Walking in and, you know, setting up shop and wrecking shop is a Louisiana problem. So, Ron, you know, I mean, something that I'm hearing from, from Ben is that we're almost able to see or maybe we're finally seeing changes that have been underway or impacts that have been underway for some time. And, and something that comes up for me, right, is that I don't know that until recently, at least in press reports, Right, we really confronted how these things have disparate impacts on people, right? So if you're a person of color, you're more likely to, to be in a situation where these things are actually gonna harm your community, and, and that cuts across uh, in different cultural groups. And so I guess I'm curious from your perspective, like working in, um, you know, in, in curation and understanding sort of the intersection of um, culture and the arts, and how we're kind of putting it together, right? Have we noticed a discernible shift in how people are actually coming over? Are we just sort of more aware of it now? How did we become more aware of it now? Does that make sense? So um, as a museum di director, our purpose with museums is to ensure that the experience that you have at this museum is the same kind of experience that your grandchildren can have, that your great-grands, that our purpose is in preserving and, and being the uh, custodian of these objects, of this space, of these experiences. And we can't do that if it no longer exists, you know? Like, uh, so five of the nine state museums are in New Orleans, and they are constantly barraged with environmental issues. That is a real challenge to our collection, to our ability to maintain our mission. Um, also, I am the first black woman to be a director in the state museum system. And there is a clear um, dovetail of my priorities and the way that I execute things in this museum system. Um, I am sure to be inclusive of all people so that's racially inclusive, that is uh, no matter your, your language, your um, physical ability, your background, that these are inclusive spaces where you feel reflected. Um, but also understanding that the people who are most vulnerable on pretty much every level are BIPOC people. They are uh, black, indigenous, people of color. And that is not something that can be easily separated in the mission and the, the, the purpose of our kinds of institutions. Um, when we, we just finished the uh, Negro Motorist Green Book exhibition at the Capitol Park Museum, and I read the, um, the uh, annual um, report for the Smithsonian, uh, for the uh, the sites and uh, traveling exhibitions. And they said that the things that are, we are facing right now is a dual uh, pandemic. It's not just that we are seeing COVID numbers and that they are ebbing and flowing and that some people are, are dying. And at the beginning, it was a lot more minorities who were dying from COVID. And that's when it started to be trivialized and, and the, the social conversation changed. Um, but they absolutely spoke about it as, as uh, they spoke about racism as being the other pandemic that we are facing. And there is no separation. There's no environmental separation. There's no social, there's no health, there's no spiritual separation between us losing our resources and our lives and our worlds and also um, being disenfranchised that the ability to make a difference and make a change and, and actually move the needle on what happens in our society has been taken away from a lot of people of color um, and given to or, or, uh, or 
stolen by uh, uh, white men who are making a lot of environmental decisions that are based on capitalism and not on human lives. And so the people who are least empowered to make the choices about their environments and their lives and the effects of what is done with pollutants, they are the least able to advocate for themselves. And so there's, there's no difference, there's no separation. Um, and, and my world is, is very nuanced and it overlaps many different fields. Um, but I, I speak passionately about all of it because it all affects me and people that look like me and people who share this state with me, you know, um, our families. And so to what you said, everything that I do is trying to make the world better. And everything that we should be doing should be making the world better. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Sam, I mean, something that, that Renita touched on, right, is the idea that cultural institutions kind of have a responsibility to preserve or advocate for or to broadcast, you know, folk ways, right? Whether that's um, you know, institutional art or something that comes from uh, the grassroots, right? Something that's at risk here, you know, as, as people lose their homes is the very culture that they've expressed for generations. I mean. I don't know, I guess I'd be curious to know, I mean, what role does an institution like ACA have in actually preserving that? I mean, I think a lot of people look at this and say, okay, there's the gallery, and the, I'll go see the drive-by truckers there, right? But I mean, to what extent um, is there a responsibility for, for, for institutions to actually like, you know, say stop, we gotta do something here, right? That kind of pulls you out of perhaps like the normal boundary that kind of surrounds organizations like yours. Well, you know, something that, Pradina, uh, you said in particular uh, kind of resonated to me with something that Ben said when Ben was talking about uh, how advances in technology for, you know, how we assess and how we actually look at things is giving us a much better view of what the state was already, you know. We didn't have to observe it for it to be bad. We're just finding out how bad it is because we're observing it. I think, you know, as, as we're having a lot of advances in uh, you know, scientific technology. We're also having a lot of advances in social technology. You know, we're 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 creating and using and refining tools to have better conversations about uh, inequity, about you know the human condition. Uh, go figure. You know, it's it's kind of important. Uh, but I think just like we've seen with uh, scientific technology too, uh, the tools are only as useful as uh, the user is willing to use them. You know, you see vaccine hesitancy. It's so closely paralleled with things like uh, people who are very paranoid about critical race theory. <laughs> and so I think institutions in culture are in a social and cultural environment. And it's our job to be, um, you know, helping test and refine and improve the social technology that we use that knits us together as an actual society or tears us apart as a society. Uh, so, you know, it, it's our space. Uh, we can either choose to acknowledge that and participate in that, which is difficult and controversial and has risks, or we can avoid it, uh, which is really easy and very comfortable and probably more lucrative. <laughs> I feel like maybe a theme that's emerging here is like, look, the elephant's there, just now we can measure it. So now we know how big the elephant is, right? You know, um, so, and I kind of want to bring you in here, Ben. I mean, you know, something you said earlier, it's like, right, like we can measure it, we can talk about it, it becomes quantifiable, it becomes less deniable, yet people still deny it. You know, this, you're talking about appealing to people's uh, sense of reason. I feel like it's fair to say we are exiting the age of reason. So. What, what do we do, right? I mean, is, is, am I just being too cynical about this? Well, no, you're not, because it, it's very difficult for us to explain our science to the public. You know, we're not necessarily trained science communicators. But then when we get into a panel like this and we start talking and the cameras are on, we might come out and say something that doesn't, you know, line up right, you know, perfectly if we're talking out of our field, you know, outside of our field. 
And that happens a lot. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to blame the journalists for, for directing people in any of these <laughs> situations, but we have seen this in the past year or so where you get this guy up on, and he's talking about COVID or whatever, and he is not an epidemiologist, right? So the same kind of stuff happens with the toxicity, and it, the debate rages on. There, there will always be people going back and forth, and there's no effect. There, you know, and I'm like, oh, there's an effect. I mean, look, you, you see the data right here. These people are sick. There's no effect. Right, so that's gonna um, always gonna go back and forth. Um, the problem, the good thing is, is now it's getting harder and harder to deny it. And then, you know, it, that's that's my responsibility is making it impossible to deny, right? You know, or, or to just do good science. So I mean, if it's deniable, great, whatever. You know, it doesn't matter what the result is, and you know, in my opinion, it's the result is what it is. So uh, I think that. You know, doing good science and then partnering with people who can talk properly. <laughs> Dealing, you know, partnering with Brandon or, you know, these other people who are very good at communicating science in general is, um, is a service to the community, right? Yeah, Brandon, I mean, it seems like what you do is sitting at this intersection, right, um, in terms of communication or in terms of how people come to understand the world around them. Or, is one way in which human beings understand their own condition and the condition outside. I, I know that you've, you know, made a point in sort of getting out, meeting people, right, doing your work in the field, you know, and have you found that people's, you know, attitudes towards this have softened or is it really just the way they talk about it? Um, no, absolutely. I mean, uh, I've, I've been doing art and science collaboration for two decades and it's got, it's gotten way more open across the spectrum. Like people are much more open to the idea that art is not gonna save the world, science is not gonna save the world. One discipline is not gonna save the world, but maybe combined together with creativity and other people's backgrounds will have a chance. <laughs> um, so the field cultural institutions have changed. Um, initially art and science exhibitions or anything that combines science into an art exhibition I would say since the since the 90s were really frowned upon, 80s and 90s, and then it's like come a long way. Um, so art and science has become one of the bigger fields in the cultural sector outside of Louisiana, but also growing in Louisiana. Um, also because we're realizing once again, we need to look at issues from different perspectives and understand that they're complicated. Um, and I also see, one of the, Ben and I have, uh, we're, We've worked a lot with uh, folks at National Academy of the Sciences, and that's a whole other area where they're trying to work with artists. So there's scientists that are wanting to collaborate with artists. There's also scientists that are learning to communicate better with the public. Um, and there's also a lot of artists that are getting more and more engaged with science and, and, and real world issues and want to kind of use the, the creativity and the, the, the tools of communication or expressing, I should say, because I don't think the, the the role of fine art is not to communicate necessarily. I think it's more to inspire and, and engage questions and then um, maybe curiosity and maybe provoke sometimes, but um, it's not just illustration or something like that. But I think there's lots of artists that are going and digging in deeper in subjects like that, for sure. So this raises an interesting question to me, right? Like if, if maybe uh, sort of the spheres in which this conversation is taking place, the way people are thinking about it, right, is the academy, art institutions, scientific institutions, I think, fair to say, these have traditionally been considered white spaces, right? I think it's you know, criticized that way. Um, this is a different world now in some ways. I mean, Ronita, I'm curious, we feel like we're getting to a point now where the, the right people are at the table having the conversation. I mean, at the end of the day, right, kind of the conversation only really matters who's actually having it, right? So, you know, are we actually making progress there or no? Of course there's progress. Um... Is there enough progress yet? Probably not. Um, we're moving in the right direction. You know, I'm 37 years old, and they made me a director. And I'm just like, oh, oh, yeah, sure. But there, are, <laughs> but there are other people in my generation and and nearing that that are becoming the most uh, accountable person in these kinds of spaces. Uh, there are conversations that are happening and there's evolution of the, uh, the, the role that museums play in the world. Um, at one point in time, 
we were the keeper of all information. We had all of the knowledge. We sat at our ivory towers and disseminated things and shared with the, the peasants the, the things that we thought were <laughs> relevant for them in their little lives. That's not the case anymore. We have the internet, like everybody, all the time, on their phone. All information is just out there. So it's important that we are curating things, that we are bringing things to light that, uh, that illuminate untold stories, histories that have been purposely suppressed, um, inaccuracies that we've come with the, the light of time, the, the fullness of time, to understand in a broader, richer, uh, more nuanced way. Like that's the role that museums play now. We no longer um, are, are the keeper of all of these things. So the ego that once existed in museums, um, there's no room for them anymore. And so a lot of the people who needed the ego, who needed the, to be the most important person in the room, are stepping aside because they are obsolete. So we are democratizing museums. We're having meaningful conversations that uh, really lift voices in their own words, and we're engaging. Uh, we're not a top-down institution as we once were. It's now a bottom-up. How do we um, use our platform to uh, bring light, to bring attention, to use our, our um, audience uh, to bring things that are relevant to our communities? And that's, that's the thing that I am actively trying to do with my institutions is create relevant spaces that have all of the importance and the pomp and ceremony of a museum and an intellectual space and a space that is true and has done the research and can be honest. And that if you read something on the wall, it's because it happened. Um, and it's not just from the point of view of the victor. Um, it's sometimes the victim. It's sometimes the disenfranchised person who did not have a voice historically, who was written as part of the property of the home. They now have an empowerment. And yes, a lot of these stories are gone. There's so many things that we've just lost. But the intention in resurfacing um, some of these untold stories that somehow have survived is kind of the, the new direction that a lot of institutions are, are having. Uh, a lot of the conversations that are meaningful are not just this is the person who won and they're really cool and they're now on a pedestal in the middle of the city, but this is the person who uh, was enslaved in that home. And the reason that this institution exists was because it was built by the people who look like me. And, and so, yeah. And, and if you want to celebrate or you know, memorialize a, a war victory or something, yes. memorialize something that you know, freed 10,000 enslaved people. Absolutely. Like the Battle of Pinhook Bridge in Lafayette. Yes. Something where there is literally like a little brass plaque next to the Pinhook Bridge. Mm -hmm. You have to be staying in the Doubletree Hotel and be pretty bored to go <laughs> find it. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, these I are the conversations that are happening right now. Yeah. And, and we are the people who are bringing to light these kinds of, of really momentous things that create the world that we exist in right now. Um, and without every single contribution from every single person, we would not be where we are at this moment. Sam, something you said earlier, right, was, yeah, somebody might look at this exhibition and be like, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't want any of that, <laughs> and they're just not going to show up. But isn't that the problem? I mean, if, you know, you're only really presenting this information to people who are inclined to show up, you know, you're preaching to the proverbial choir. So how do you take that? without locking people in a room and saying, you have to look at this. But I mean, you know, take something like that and put it in an environment where people who are you know, uninclined to be exposed to it are exposed to it. Well, I don't know if you know Butch Roussel. I do know Butch Roussel. Uh, he likes showing people this bell chart, bell curve, that has people who are highly engaged on one end of it, people who are highly disengaged on the other. 
and disengage being, you know, the haters. Uh, they will essentially engage, but to spoil or to create woe. Uh, on the other side, you have, you know, the highly engaged for positive, you know, help to try to do something, try to make something new, to try to fix a problem. Um, and of course, those are the bottom ends of the bell curve, where they're the fewest people at the extremes. And the majority of people are in the middle, who have a job and a family, or in a, you know, at the, the daily concerns maybe overcome those things that go beyond the personal space. Uh, but you start to eke down one way or the other, <laughs> and you start to find people who are maybe on their way to becoming one or the other, uh, or through work. Uh, can become, say, can go from being sort of inclined to take action and inclined to try to be a part of the positive change because they're over here on the end of the curve and they really just need the right, you know, nudging to become somebody who really gets engaged and really goes from being an observer of problems to a, you know, a problem solver. Uh, and that's the space where there's the most productivity for something like Brandon's exhibition. Uh, because I'm sure there's somebody over here on the other end of the spectrum who specifically came here to be mad about it. <laughs> but we, don't, we really don't care about them. Because we can't do anything for them that's very sad. Uh, but over here, there, you know, there are people who maybe just need that, you know, that extra step. And there's actually a lot more of those people. You know, there are a lot of people right there who are one step away or one, you know, lesson or engagement away from uh, being a little more, you know, being active in whatever process, fixing whatever problem is in front of them. And there's also marketing, you know, <laughs> honestly, um, the Museums way- Museums just discovered marketing like 10 years ago. Dude, I'm taking a marketing class right now, elucidating. Yeah, that's what I'm <laughs> It's just like, I've been doing it all wrong. <laughs> but there's marketing. And so for, uh, so if this exhibition were at my museum, in sports magazines, we would be talking about fish species. In uh, environmental magazines, we'd be talking about extinction. In uh, art magazines, we'd be talking about the, the surface and the, the, the texture and the um, medium. It is getting people where they live mm -hmm. and, and making it something relevant to them. That's not something that we've always done in museums. We've done more of a buckshot of like, this is what we're doing, it's awesome, everyone come see it. But now we understand the nuance, especially with social media marketing, that if we're trying to bring in a new audience, we need to explain to them why they should care. And having those conversations in a, in a broad way is, really moving the needle. Like, I am engaging with lots of brand new people that I'd never met before, and they like that a black girl's running this museum, you know? And then we've got the people who, uh, at, at Capitol Park, came because it's a Smithsonian exhibition. Um, you know, that's what we played up on our NPR ad. Um, and then on, um, the, on the surface, we talked about children and the understanding. Um, Exxon was our big sponsor for the, the nationwide exhibition, and they were integral to the production and distribution of the Green Book. So like, there are different ways of understanding how to grow our audiences, and we don't have to disenfranchise really anyone except for the people on the bottom of the bell curve on the wrong side. What is the Green Book? So the Negro Motors Green Book was a book that was, it's a travel guide that was produced from 1936 through 1967. And it gave the way that uh, black people could have um, their best trip. Uh, so it was places, uh, hotel rooms that they can stay in. Uh, it was where they could eat, get their hair done, uh, grocery stores that accepted black people. It was dude ranches that they could go to because everyone wants to have the freedom of the road. Everyone wants to have this, this experience, but it was denied to a large swath of people. And this uh, is after the Great Migration where a lot of people, black people from the South left and went up north to Chicago, New York, California, West, um, and they wanted to still have those familial ties. 
you know, everyone that I talked to had stories about their country cousins coming to town during the summers. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they had these, um, and sometimes it was financial, sometimes it was just to remember your roots and to understand and to have more of, of what was important to them growing up, that you have this relationship with your, your larger family. Um, but it was a it was a wonderful exhibition that really celebrated uh, the the um, entrepreneurship of Victor Hugo Green, who was the writer of the Green Book, and the impact that it made. But the the contemporary element of that is what I really enjoyed. Uh, there was a quote that said, "We got what we wanted, but we lost what we had." And in that, it talks about how desegregation caused the decline of a lot of black neighborhoods, mm -hmm. of businesses that had been solely the, the institution that supported this community, now had to compete and didn't have the support of police, of policy, of, of, of the, the community sometimes. Um, there was also a lot of disenfranchisement that happened through the interstate systems that bifurcated thriving black neighborhoods. Some neighborhoods were entirely flooded um, for waterways and things that, that were needed or wanted. And, and it was partially racial, racially motivated, and it was partially economic. You know, capitalism is important. It's the way that we exist in this world. And the exhibition that we have coming up that opens at the end of the month is the Yellow Book, and it talks about the interstate systems. And you can say, this is racist propaganda, it's horrible, how do they do this, why would they do this? But it was also, if you have to purchase land somewhere to build an uh, interstate through the established roadways and the commerce that already exists, it's a whole lot cheaper to buy in black neighborhoods and, and destroy the 400 homes that were there than it would be in a white neighborhood with a higher home value. Which is why uh, I-49 will go where it will go. Yeah. Through Lafayette. Yeah. yeah. And why eventually Thruway went where it did. Mm -hmm. And uh, Claiborne, uh, right now there's the Claiborne Project in New York, uh, New Orleans, that it is talking about um, getting rid of it, getting rid of that. Uh, how do we get our neighborhood back? How do we build community again after it's been destroyed, after all of this time that it has been lost by um, the, the disenfranchisement and, and lack of investment in these institutions. You, you bring up you know, an issue I think that's obviously <laughs> relevant to everything. I mean, we, you know, we're talking about the built environment, we're talking about where we live, mm -hmm. but certainly what we're doing is legacies, right? That there are things that we have done that perhaps may not be undone, right? I was um, on Twitter the other day, which is where I get all of my news. Um, Why wouldn't you? <laughs> it's just so convenient. And I, and I saw people, you know, God forbid, they were arguing about something. And um, I no. read that, I was like, what is all this fuss about? And I want to read this to you all because I think it'd be an interesting prompt, oddly enough, to talk about, uh, you know, a, an outlook, right? Like thinking about, like, what do we do about this, right? Or is everything lost, right? So I'm going to read this to each of you. Just the one time, I'm not going to read it four times. Are you sure? Um, so, we, we got time. <clears throat> so, I forgot the guy's name who wrote this, but he got dragged on Twitter, I'll tell you that. Um, so, not every place stricken by natural disaster should be abandoned. Where populations continue to grow, or where there is indigenous will and investment to rebuild, there is hope for recovery. That is not the case for places such as New Orleans, where populations are declining and no new job opportunities are emerging. The country must realistically assess which geographies are becoming unlivable and which are well suited to larger population settlement. It should then offer incentives for migration toward the latter and away from the former and direct infrastructure spending accordingly. The people of New Orleans should be given one-way tickets to Detroit where they can contribute to the city's nascent post-industrial revival. <laughs> That was Christian Mader tweeting that. <laughs> Read it tonight. Pretty, uh, yeah, pretty stark thing to say. I mean, I, I don't know. The, 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 the mean question would be like, Brandon, do you think they should be bought one-way tickets to Detroit? <laughs> but really, I, I think like, to me, I read this, and other people might have a different interpretation. That sounds like giving up to me. Are you ready to give up? 
I'm not. I mean, um, coastal restoration works. I mean, Mar look at Mardi Gras Pass. It's growing land. It was an accident, but it's growing land. I mean, we just need to put our creativity and our will in position and actually like do this. In short, unfortunately, some communities sadly are going to be lost. I mean, some communities probably were lost in Ida. Um, it's, it's a sad reality, but there are also communities that over time, I mean, we all know what the Mississippi River used to look like. It doesn't do that anymore. And that's had consequences. Those consequences, unfortunately, as we try to figure out a balance between restoration and keeping folks in the places they're living, somehow we have to have that conversation and discussion. It doesn't mean losing the whole city and, or, or sending people to Detroit. What it might mean is helping some folks relocate 50 miles to the north where they can still have access to the bayou and have their shrimp boats there, you know, and, and see this over multiple generations, not something that's so abrupt. Ben, I mean, you're, you're looking at this in, you know, obviously we're diff different lens perhaps, but I mean, is this, damage undone? I mean, are you giving up? Obviously, no, you we, to your... we, like we the people, don't give up, right? So that's not really an option, I don't think. The We've tried, you know, the people in St. Charles Parish, I believe, have been, they moved some people out there. It didn't work out so good, but it could have. Um, we have, there are solutions out there. I think, you know, we've got issues in reserve, too, with the Denko plant. Um, and these are other the same thing is playing out in Houston too right in the in the ship channel which was the subject of the last question of the last presidential debate right so there's like these disparities that are happening in these in these areas these places that were were wrecking that like Brandon said I mean, you could move out of the zone where you have a 56 percent increased chance of getting cancer or, or something you know so the you know, we can move people but it's not really up to us, I don't think, to make that decision. I think we need to have conversations with the communities themselves and find out what they want. Because in this situation, you know, like it's kind of like, who are we to make that decision? Um, so I think this, what we're doing here, um, being able to talk about it. You know, I was talk, talk to Brandon at length about this. Is just being able to talk about it and, and keep talking about it is. Um, you know, is very helpful, right? We know that's cathartic to have changed. Brandon, I gotta say, I wanna know more about the coastal restoration working. I mean, I, I feel like this is, it, maybe it's on the, maybe I'm spending too much time on Twitter, but what, I, 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 tell us more about how this stuff's working. Make us feel better about the environment. <laughs> yeah, well, like, I'm not, a, I'm not a coastal restoration expert by any mean. I, I, I'm a frog guy working in the fish lab at, LSU and Tulane and, and drawing lots of fishes. But there's evidence, I mean, Mardi Gras Pass is a perfect example. People can look at that, which is uh, an area in the east bank of Blackman's Parish um, below Phoenix, um, where land is growing, where it's, it's the one part of this, like, southeastern Louisiana where land is actually growing, right? So land is also growing. Warren's here. Maybe you should talk about it. Okay, not to put you on the spot, but we actually have experts in the room, and I'm not. Um, <laughs> Shall we buy the sangria keg after the... Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But, I mean, the, I think the, the larger question is not necessarily about that one particular type of science and engineering which is going to allow land to be reforming, but it's about an overall cultural adaptation to change and rapid change and trying to figure out what what's that what is that going to look like you know historically other coastal cultures have adapted to change what can we learn from those prior indigenous cultures what can we learn about the species that are adapting to do and this kind of ties back to talking about population shifts i mean in particular but you know We've talked about it, Brandon, about it being a, a fast and slow process. It, you know, it is continually happening. There is a, a beautiful and devastating documentary called Water Like Stone that's about Leeville, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not about a storm. It's about 100 years of history of the town and how it has been you know, sinking. Well, water levels are rising. Land is, is not being replenished. Uh, and it's just a portrait of a number of the 
townsfolk, the oldest person, the youngest person, people in between, uh, the sports fishermen who you know have a camp there, the people who are you know the last person to have been born in that city or city, you know, village, um, and there you know that's a slow story that's hard to see day to day. And then there's the fast version of the story that looks like Hurricane Ida, uh, that looks like Katrina. And it was a conversation we had with uh, Maida Owens, again, from the Division of the Arts, the state, about, you know, this is, this is happening. Uh, you know, Hurricane Katrina is happening again, mm -hmm. right now. And maybe it's five times bigger than that in terms of the population that was permanently displaced. 100,000 people never came back. To New Orleans. Uh, 50 years from now, how many thousands of people will not come back to their homes specifically or to the state of Louisiana potentially uh, from small events and large ones? So I think it's the, it's the scale of it or it's like the, the slow motion version of it as the elephant is just like very, you know, it gets, it's 1% bigger every yeah. year. And then in 50 years, you're like, oh, we're being crushed by this thing. But of course also, we, were gonna be. we can only retreat so far, you know. <laughs> There's only so much land that we can lose and continue to step back and step back and step back. It, we are actively trying to preserve and, and, and keep our history. Um, and, and I think about it, and, and Brandon and I were kind of talking about this early, about the, the people who remain. Um, I know that I have many generations here in Louisiana, and I have family land. I've got um, uh, places where my family was formerly enslaved, and my family's blood is in that soil. Mm -hmm. That's not something I want to retreat from. It's not something I want to give up or lose over time. And it's where it may not be uh, according to the, uh, the formula that someone may use to say that you can stay here, it's too expensive to continue to rebuild you, to, to preserve your life where it is, that's not something scientifically or even mathematically that we can articulate to another person. We live in the water in Louisiana. We live with the water, we are water, we experience the trauma and also the blessing of the water. And so there's not a separation that we want to leave from. Now, of course, there'll be some people. And yes, give them that spirit to move if that is what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But it's not for us to make the determination if they get to remain at their space and face whatever, um, what, whatever may come. Also, not everyone has the economic ability to relocate, to create a new life, to upend whatever it is that they have had, have experienced, um, and, and have historically and generationally um, been able to maintain. Um, we get the question all the time, why, do people, why doesn't everyone evacuate when there's a storm? Because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. Because you have to have a place to go. Because you have to have the money, the gas money, you have to have a vehicle. You have to have upward mobility. You have to have the health to relocate. And not everyone has all of those elements that gives them that upward mobility. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I'm going to keep bringing in all of these topics within the topic because all of this is directly related. There's no separation between uh, poverty and, and, um, and race and uh, history and art and science and the water and, and, and the natural disasters. There's no separation because that's the existence that we all live in. We are not a single topic. We're not a single understanding. We are every single element and everything that happens to us, everything we do, everything we are is directly tied to our life, our land, our understanding, and our appreciation for what we can do and what we have done in the past. So I kind of want to beam Louis in one last time here as we kind of wrap up. He's been kind of like perusing his letter and, and thinking about it. And, and I hope that we could kind of get to a stage where we could think about the idea that there is 
something we can do about it, that, that this is achievable, this is not, you know, Pollyannish in the slightest, mm -hmm. that people are actually working on these problems and they're, they're making progress, right? So, so Louis has an anecdote in here that he closed with, and I think it's fitting for us to close with that. So he says, you know, earlier this week I had the pleasure of speaking and playing some music at this CPEC summit on reality of renewables and integrated practices. On the panel were Dr. Terrence Chambers, he's Director of Energy Efficiency and Sustainability at UL. Um, and he's spearheading renewable energy training and production in Lafayette. Jason Beckfield, professor of sociology at Harvard, and a guy named Mayor Terry Wycombe, who has successfully implemented a large-scale wind turbine, uh, wind turbines in his community of Rawlins, Wyoming. What really struck me about Mayor Wycombe, and I'll close with this, is that he was able to navigate his community's skepticism of renewable energy and rebuild his economy in doing so. Much like South Louisiana, the struggle with implementing renewable energy in Rawlins was in changing the mindset and educating the community. He was initially met with resistance, but once people saw their economy start to grow, uh, new jobs created, and landowners who, whose property the wind turbines were installed on suddenly able to uh, afford a new house and a new car, much like the recent past here in Louisiana, people quickly warmed up to the idea. Mayor Wycombe proved to his community that moving forward in a more sustainable manner does not mean having to lower our standard of living, and that the sooner we embrace diverse energy production, the better off we'll be economically and environmentally. I will leave this to guys to, to, to you. I mean, any last words, Brandon? Well, um, I met Louis when we were down uh, at Grand Bois doing hurricane relief uh, a few weeks ago. And one thing that really struck, and we talked about it, is the houses that had roofs were ones with solar panels. So <laughs> unfortunately, back to this idea heavier. of socioeconomic <laughs> challenges, I'm sure those folks, maybe there was an incentive. There used to be federal incentives and state incentives to have solar panels installed on your roof. Hopefully that's something that uh, we can vote into being again. You know, mm -hmm. the, But that idea, it was amazing. And I saw it again in Homa, and I saw it again um, in Plaquemines Parish. For whatever reason, those solar panels, not only did it help people immediately after the fact when they lost electricity for weeks, it literally helped keep their home together. Ben, final thoughts? Um, I think we need to continue these kind of conversations. I think it's nice to be included, you know, have scientists included in this kind of discussion. Uh, and I like to see this. I like to see more of it. Ronita? Support your museums. Become members. Be invested in your community. Put a ring on it. Ooh. Put a ring on it. Define your relationship with the museum. Yeah, Absolutely. I, like I mean, <laughs> or else they will not survive. <laughs> they will go away. <laughs> uh, Sam. Uh, my final word is a, a short story. Is that all right, Christian? You, you own the place. Uh, <laughs> it's owned by the city of Lafayette. The people of Lafayette. Thank you, citizens. Uh, but in... It, a conversation we've had around this is, you know, what can you do? Like I said, you know, if, if it's a slow motion Katrina that's happening, uh, it's happening. We can, we can see it. We can observe it now culturally, scientifically in many ways. But if you knew it was going to happen tomorrow, you could do something, you know, as opposed or, or three days from now or a month from now or a year from now or 10 years or 20. Uh, you could do something. And that's, that's the opportunity, even if it is... Uh, even if you can't stop the thing, you can uh, mitigate the effect. Uh, one, you know, population movement was something that happened with Katrina that's really devastating to Louisiana, period. Uh, the movement, the, the, you know, evacuation and the permanent evacuation. Something that, again, Maida had really brought to mind was the role of arts and culture and just cities in general in uh, needing to be better at uh, thinking about their neighbor and being a good neighbor and being a welcoming neighbor. Uh, and the anecdote is that after uh, Hurricane Delta and Laura uh, devastated like Charles last year, uh, there was some extreme bad press about the city of Lafayette that owns this building, uh, which, which was that the, you know, the, the city said, you know, we're not accepting, quote unquote, you know, climate or refugees, or we're not accepting um, people here. There will be no mass shelters here. And it became really bad press because that sounds horrible. And the reason for that was 
because they weren't allowed to, but it never really made the press that way. The reason was you don't open a mass shelter in a zone that could be hit by a hurricane the next week. You have to do it outside of the hurricane zone, but that wasn't what the story was about, but it was the narrative. And I think the, the city and you know, in, a lot of people responded to that so viscerally because the story was Lafayette says, like Charles, you're not welcome, you know? And like nothing could make me feel worse as a human being being here than that being a headline about me. Uh, and skip a year ahead and you've got Hurricane Ida, uh, you know, significantly devastating many communities in southeastern Louisiana. And once again, Lafayette and the middle of Acadiana stands kind of un, untouched by it. But suddenly, the narrative was completely different. It was clear that there was a coordinated effort by the city, the Visitor and Convention uh, Commission, and a lot of partners to say, we need to make sure that the message that's going out about our community and the role we play in things like this is we're here to help. Like, here's how many hotel rooms are available all throughout the region. We're calling them. We're finding out what you need. Call us if you're just driving through, if you need gas, if you need support, if you need you know, help. Like, we may not be able to help, but like, we're not gonna talk about the fact that we can't open a mass shelter, but we're gonna tell you about what we can do. And I thought, I thought that that was such a, a sea change. And of course, you know, journalism and, and, and narratives are complicated because it's the, the you know, you're telling a story. Uh, you're trying to tell the story. But I think it was really interesting to see those stories flip so completely in 12 months, and especially see people coordinating and behaving differently at a, a local government level, and try to become a welcoming place, very intentionally, to that specific kind of audience. So that's my closing, Mark, is I'm excited to see how that continues to progress. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, I think the, the lesson maybe is, you know, they say that all disasters are man-made, right? which also means that we have a lot of control over the situation. So, uh, Sam Oliver, Executive Director of ACA, thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, Rod Nuna Hart, um, Division Director at Louisiana State uh, Museum. We have Brandon Bollinger, artist. And Ben Dubansky, return to Louisiana, no longer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for being here, we appreciate it.